Today we're going to be learning how to set up a ceiling fan that will work both in multiplayer and single player scenarios. You'll be able to have a light switch that both players can interact with and it will turn and turn off the fan. Let's get started. First off, you're going to be needing these two models. They're, they're free right now, so you don't have to pay for them or anything. We have both the ceiling fan, we'll be using the FBX, and we have this light switch model, we'll be using the model. When you download them, you'll get the ceiling fan as such, and you'll also get a zip file of the light switch, which we can just drag out here. Which, it's hiding, it went to my other window. There it is, okay. Before we use the ceiling fan in Unreal, we will need to modify it, however. I'll put the modified version of it in YouTube down below, but I'm gonna go ahead and show you how I'm editing it. I want to be able to make it to where we can change the height of the cable on that particular fan. First, I'm gonna delete everything here. I'm going to import the FBX file that we downloaded. Go to my desktop, I believe. Fan. And it's going to import fairly small. I'm going to click this scale size over here, click in the middle, left drag, totally mess it up. Try it again. There we go. Just scale it up a bit. It's fine. And it doesn't need to be perfect or anything. But I do want the origin of the model to be the top of this base right here. And that should be just about fine. Now, this fan is almost perfect as far as how uh, it's separated, because if you look here, it's separated in three separate models. The wings, which are actually separated into three separate wings, one, two, and three. And the cable, which is actually the cable and the base smushed together when I split that, and the body, which is just fine. For the wings, however, we are going to select each one, shift, click each one, and then control J that will merge them into one model file. This way when we rotate it in Unreal, it doesn't have to rotate each one, it just rotates the one model. So leave that there. And the base we'll leave alone. However, we need to split the cable off from the, the body, the, well, the base. And so to do that, we need to go to Object Edit Mode, and we are actually going to select up here in the top left, the Face Select. And we're just gonna select the faces of the the wire so i'm holding shift to select all of them making sure this is selected i'm also going down here i'm shift middle clicking to drag the screen around and i'm going to select the vertices or well oops shift select the edges Ooh, that's a bit too much just select all the edges Shift select all the edges. And vertices, just making sure I get everything. Okay, so now that we have all that selected, you can right click it and click separate by selection. So now, if we go back to object mode, we'll see that the wire is a separate selection from the, the base. We're going to rename that. We're going to name that base and name that wire, cable, it doesn't matter. It's fine. Uh, so we have those two, those four different objects, which is great. And now that we've finished here, I'm going to go ahead and export as an FBX. Going to not bake any animations because we don't have any animations here to bake. It's just a plain model. And I'm going to name it Scene Fan fixed because we fixed it and export okay we're finished here don't need to save that and here's the new one i'm going to delete this old one so i don't import the wrong one so we have this light switch and the ceiling fan so let's go ahead and open up a new unreal project so let's go ahead and open up a new unreal project i want to go ahead and use unreal 4.27 anything that we do today will work in 4.26 and pretty much anything earlier um, as we're, it's pretty basic what we'll be setting up today. We're also going to be using the first person template. However, this will work pretty much in any uh, template that you choose. 
I'm mostly just using first person for how we're going to be interacting with it. We're going to use it as a ceiling fan tutorial project. Though the base project, we don't, we're not going to change anything really as we're going to be creating different things. Um, but we do need to make a ceiling for this. So I'm just going to zoom in here. I'm going to hold alt. I'm going to drag up to create a duplicate of that particular thing here. I'm going to press R, squish it down for a roof panel. Press W, drag it over. And I'm going to press R here, raise it up to, why not? Now we have a roof to use for the ceiling fan. I'm going to drag this up higher too. There we go. Should be just fine. Now we have this set up. I control shift S to save everything. And we need to go ahead and import our files here. So first off, I'm going to go back to content and I'm going to create a new folder. Let's call this the tutorial folder. And it's going to open it here. We are working in here. This is kind of the directory of a first person project. It doesn't really matter, but First off, we're going to create a meshes folder because we're going to import these meshes that we have. Now we have these meshes right here, these two. We're going to go ahead and import these meshes one by one. We'll drag the ceiling fan first. It's going to have all these default settings. doesn't really matter. Um, it, this might matter because of the size of the fan. We didn't model this fan. We kind of just pulled it from the internet. And so the Uniform scale of one might be okay, but we can change that after we import it. It doesn't really matter. You notice that it has each of the four sections that we had before. There's no textures applied to it because we just imported it as an FPX. And I don't think it came with any textures from the website anyway. That's fine. I'm going to control shift S to save all of those. And now it's in the project. And I'm actually gonna move these to ceiling fan folder just for organization's sake. I'm also going to right click, create new folder and name this light switch. Open that folder up, drag the switch object in here. We're going to leave everything the same. It's fine. We'll do a little scale later. I did pull in some materials. I can maximize this now. And we're probably not going to use any of those materials, which is fine. Oh, also, if you don't have your content browser here, and that's kind of, I guess, my default setup, you can go to window and open up one of your content browsers or you can just straight up hit this content button here and it should bring it up. Usually it's a different tab or a whole different window altogether. I just like embedding it up here for myself and I'm doing little things here, which is fine. So at this point we need to go ahead and create the actor of the ceiling fan as a blueprint because not only is it going to combine all these meshes together so that they're one coherent object, but it's also going to add some logic to it as far as turning the fan on, having it rotate and everything. So we're gonna go back to the tutorial, tutorial folder, create a new folder called Blueprints. This is just for organization's sake. And we're going to create a new Blueprint class. The fan will just be an actor because it will be an object that is going to be placed or spawned in the world that we're gonna be using. We'll just name it BP for Blueprint underscore ceiling fan. Control Shift F to save it. Just a good habit to have. I double clicked it to open it up. It opened up in a separate window, which is fine, but I'm gonna drag that in tier into here so I have these two windows. Now your layout may look a little different, it's okay. For now though, I'm gonna drag this up here so that our viewport is the main thing. Squish this over to the side. I also have a content browser over here. You can add that by going to content browser, clicking on one of the extra ones and just drag it down to here. If you like that, oops. So, I need to add all of those meshes that we just imported. So we had them in the tutorial meshes folder. We'll do the ceiling fan first. I'm going to shift, collect, select all these. Click first one, shift, click the other one. Drag this into the scene. And we are actually going to make the scene root. We're gonna make a new scene root be the base so that this is like the core, the, the, the base of the object. So we have the fan here. It's a little big. I bet you if we compile this, save this, and if we dragged this fan into here, that's, you know, that's actually pretty good size. If your fan is way too big, and you're noticing that this is just a really weird size, you can adjust that by coming into 
the ceiling fan and you can modify each one. I would modify them uniformly, uniformly. So if you do, you double click on one, it'll open up the fan or whatever object, whatever model you selected. And if you go to the build settings and then build scale, you can change the scale here. If it's too small and make it bigger, like maybe two on each one, oops, two, two, hit enter, click apply changes. You notice I'll make it bigger. It's not actually cut off. It's just hidden beneath this plane that they have there. But mine was pretty, pretty good when I imported it. So I'm gonna go ahead and leave that as the same and not change it or touch it. This will be important because later on we're gonna do some logic to change this wire, to change the length of it and kind of have you be able to customize the fan. But we have the fan imported, which is good. We also want to, let's go ahead and add the light switch as well. And we're going to add this to the actor itself because we want it to kind of be associated with the fan too. So I'm going to, on this blueprint, going to go back a folder, back to meshes, over to light switch, shift click all of the models that were imported along with the light switch. These big circles are materials. We don't need those. We'll, we're gonna override that later. And let's go ahead and drag it in. Now we do want one of the light switches to be kind of the, the main one. And we want it to be the base, which is kind of the panel. Can't really see it, but it's really teeny tiny. And that's okay, we can adjust the scale. Oh goodness, later. If you're thinking the camera's moving too quickly, you can click up here in the top right corner and adjust that camera speed. I'm gonna make it two. It's pretty good, it's not too fast. But I do want this base to be the, the, the parent object of the light switch. So I'm gonna control click these other three, drag them and attach it to that particular object. So now if I move, if I have this object selected, <coughs> it's compiled, save that and I move that, it moves all of them together. Now it's really tiny, <laughs> so I'm going to increase the size. We can do it uniformly by dragging this. If I clicked R when I have this selected and drag this white square, it'll increase the size of all of them. And you'll notice that both the light switch and the two screws scaled appropriately. Textures are kind of weird, but it's fine. It's a free model. We didn't have to work to, to make it. It works just dandy. I might actually make it a little bigger. It's fine. Okay. So now that we have the light switch and the fan, both in the same blueprint project, we can go ahead and do some logic to this. First, we're going to do the logic of having the actual fan blade spin um, on button press. So, to get into that part for now so if you when you're in the blueprint <clears throat> you might see the construction script event graph and viewport <clears throat> if you go ahead and click on event graph you'll see these basic ones here begin play these three you can select all of those press the delete key and get rid of those we don't we won't be needing those we're not going to be doing the rotation of the fan on tick because it's actually better to not have tons of things running on tick uh, and have it run on like a timeline instead um so we have that here. Let's go ahead and start working on this. So our first function is just gonna be the, the base function of turning the fan on or off. So I'm gonna right click, type in custom event, hit enter, and we're gonna call this turn fan on slash off. I'm gonna zoom in so you can see this a bit better. And we're gonna compile, save that. And we're gonna have this be kind of a, uh, a branch. So I'm gonna drag off, type in branch, and this is going to be based off of a, a Boolean value of whether it's on or whether it's off. So I want to promote this to a local variable. So I just dragged off. I'm going to click promote to variable. And oops, this condition is going to be called, I'm going to hit F2. Oh, I can't hit F2. F2 over here. And just call this on off. That's fine. Now, from here, if it is true, or if it is on, I want it to turn it off, right? And if it is off, I want to turn it on. So technically I need to do a not of this, a not Boolean. So if it's on, then do the opposite, do the false tree uh, branch. If it's off, do the true branch. So we want it to turn it on. So here's where I will then say, okay, well, we're turning it on. I need to set it to on. And if we're turning it off, 
I need to set it to off. Uncheck that. I just control C and control V to copy that right there. Now we needed to also call the function to say, okay, we'll activate the fan and then flip the switch, you know, at the same time. So what we need to do is we need to create another custom event. So we're going to call, so right click to type in custom event, hit enter. And we're going to call this one, just activate fan. It's good enough. And we're also going to create another one, custom ooh, event and call this one stop fan. So now that we've created those two custom events, if we compile and save, we can then call them here. Activate fan. I just typed in active and it was able to find it. And stop fan. It's kind of bothering me. We're going to call this one deactivate fan. There we go. Compile, save. And now we have it doing those two. Now, when it activates the fan, that's going to make the, the fan blades spin, but we need that light switch to also flip. So we need to create in the event graph, other functions too, to flip the light switch. So custom event, and we're going to label this one flip switch. Ooh, sleep. I hit F2 and that allowed me to re-edit that one there. Okay. So we need to call that function to flip switch. Now this one needs to be called both times because we're going to flip the switch to activate it and to deactivate it, right? So we're going to pass this value to this one. So flip switch needs to be able to know whether it needs to turn on or turn off. So we're going to add an input to this particular function because this function needs to have an input of what it's going, of what, of what it needs to know before performing the action. So we're going to add, add a new parameter. This parameter will be a Boolean. Luckily it was already selected, but just select Boolean if it wasn't and type in on slash up so that we know which one it is. You'll notice that as we did that, it put it up here and we need to pass this particular Boolean to there so that the function knows what to perform. This will be when it's off. This will be when it's on policy. So that's kind of the core of how the fan will be turning on and turning off. And now we need to actually start defining these guys. So when the fan activates, logically, you want it to start spinning. We want the blades to, to rotate, right? And they need to rotate as a fan would do. And that would be in the blue or the Z axis. You'll notice how Z is blue and it's going to be rotating along the axis as if the fans active. Let me undo that rotation. And so if we wanted to add rotation, to the Z axis. That is the uh, desired effect. So what we need to do is we need to select the wings. So this is the wing, mind you, the wing model. And we want this model, you can drag it down here, to be, I'm gonna rename that because this is gonna bother me. We're gonna call this fan blades. Table. I'm pressing F2 to rename the thing. Uh, body and base. Much better. And we're just going to call this switch. Oh, panel. And I think the switch button. Yeah, that's the actual light switch. So we'll call that light switch. That's fine. The screws, I don't really care about. We're gonna leave those. That way, we, whenever we're messing with these things, it'll, it'll actually make sense. So our desired effect is to add a rotation, add a rotation to the fan blades because we want it to rotate, right? And we're gonna add relative rotation because we don't want to have it, it if you did, let's see these other ones, add rotation. If you added local rotation, that could work as well, but the relative location is better in this scenario because we're it's not the actor that's rotating. It's just the, the component of the actor. So relative rotation relative to the actor makes more sense than local rotation for it. 
I know. So we're going to be using that one. Now we need to have something that can slowly add rotation to it and not just rotate it immediately. Because if I was trying to rotate this, I mean, a fan generally rotates slowly, right? It doesn't just instantly go from that to, to that. That doesn't make any sense. So the proper term for that in Unreal is lerping. So we're going to add another, we're going to search for a blueprint or an action rather, and then look for lerp. And we're going to lerp a rotator. And this should look like this for you. It's actually really useful. And we're going to split this particular structure. Click right click on B. We're going to split structure pin. And we want to rotate the yaw. The yaw is the Z axis. And that is the, oh, the axis, the blue that we're wanting to rotate. So we want to have this value slowly over time kind of um, spin. And when a fan turns on, it, it starts spinning um, slowly and then it gets to its max speed, right? It kind of gradually grows up to it. And so we need some kind of timeline to determine that. Since we're not running this on tick, Unreal needs to know over what amount of time do you want it to spin up and start rotating. And so Unreal has a cool action here called timeline, add timeline, that we can actually create one. So we're going to start this fan start. And we want whenever we activate the fan to start from the beginning of this animation. And as we do this, let's double click this. We need to define a timeline here. This, this is kind of cool. You'll be using these a lot for when a door opens or when a window's opening or you want to just slowly lerp an animation. This is really useful. Anyway, so you start off by clicking this add float track and we're going to start this fan start. It really doesn't matter this one. And we need to add a keyframe. This is kind of like an animation. And we're going to have this be at zero and zero. So it's perfectly at the zero part. I'm right clicking to drag and I'm using the middle mouse wheel to zoom in and zoom out. We're going to make the length of it. The fan will start up. We'll say it takes three seconds to start the fan going to max speed, right? And we need to add another keyframe. And this one's going to be at value of one because it's 100% of the speed that we're going to give it. And it's going to take three seconds to get to there. So I'm right clicking to, to zoom out or right clicking to drag middle mouse wheel to zoom out. And we want it to be smooth. This is just a very linear, very boring kind of gradual ascension to speed. So we're going to right click and click auto on the first key point. And we're going to right click. That's probably fine. You could click auto here as well, but it seemed like that kind of messed it up. Let's undo that control Z. Let's leave it like that. And so now we kind of have this gradual of it speeding up uh, over time. The, the amount of rotation it's going to be adding will gradually grow larger. And so if we look at this, we now have a, a timeline that will provide a growing percent value of what to do. And we want that, since this is like a percentage value of how much speed it needs to give, this will go into the alpha of the lerp, which is how much it needs to um, provide of the value that we give it. And the resulting rotation, we want it to be added to the fan. And so we will return that to this add relative rotation. And we want this to update for every um, second, every millisecond that this that this timeline is going on. So we're going to have it on the update function. Now, the amount of speed that we want to give this, that we would want this fan to reach, we're going to have that be kind of customizable. So we're going to take this yaw, the Z value. Remember, we, we have this because we split. Remember, normally this looks like, uh, well, I can't combine it, but normally it was, it was like this in blue, but we split it by right clicking, click, oh, there we go. We right clicked it and split the struct spin pin. And we're going to promote the Z value to a variable. And we're going to call this, um, where is it over here? We're going to call it fan speed. Now we want this, we're going to compile and save that. It luckily it's a float already because we dragged it off of there and promoted it to a variable. So it's already a float. So it can be like 1.2 or 20 or 400 or whatever. And we want this to be editable whenever we drag it into the map. And so let me close that. 
And so what we need to do for that is we need to add click this little eyeball. And if you do that, it will be edit the variable is public and is editable on each instance of this blueprint. Super useful. And to kind of categorize this, we're going to add it into a different category. We're going to come over here on the right side, set the category instead of default, we're just going to put this under the setup category. And so whenever we drag this into the world, you'll notice that you have this setup category over here and the fan speed. So we can like set it to 30 or whatever. And that can vary. Maybe you put four different fans. You want one to be faster or slower than the other one. Kind of gives you power um, over customizing the blueprint that you created. So we now have this thing, this timeline that will go for three seconds and then stop. Now, if we started this now, you'll see the fan will rotate for three seconds, spinning up and then just immediately stop. And that's not how fans work, right? They keep going. So when that animation is finished, we need it to do a different animation. We need to do a different rotation addition, if you will. So what we're going to do is we're going to kind of create another timeline because this timeline, we want the speed to be constant and consistent over time. So we're going to right click, type in timeline, add timeline, and we're just going to call this um, fan running, whatever, because it's just continually going. And we're going to, whenever this animation is finished, we're going to play from start on this guy. And we're going to double click this, do the exact same thing. We're going to create a float track, add a curve. Now we don't, we only need one keyframe because we want this to be consistent. So even at zero, we want the value to be one. And just have it always be one. The length can be one second, that's fine. And it will always be 100% of the speed that we give it. Now, the unique thing here is we want it to loop. That's the key point here. We're going to save that, compile it. And we come back, we'll notice that it has this little um, repeating symbol. That's what we want. Now, we need to repeatedly do this, this same exact thing. But since it's already at 100%, whenever we give it this alpha value, it's going to just always give it the max speed that we provide it. So we're gonna actually select all of this, Control C to copy, Control V to paste. I'm right clicking to drag this window around, by the way. And then on every frame or every second, millisecond, whenever update that. And it will keep updating it with the fan speed that we've already given it at full speed. Now I could say just one here, whatever, it's the same thing, but just for consistency sake, we'll have it like this. So compile and save. So now we have the activate fan function set. So we need to have an option for it to deactivate the fan. This once again, whenever you turn off a fan, it doesn't just stop immediately. It's, it slows down over time. And so what we're going to do is we're going to create another timeline. So right click timeline. And this is fan stop. And we want this one to start play from the start. We're going to double click fan stop and Add a float track. We'll make it three seconds again as well. Oops, that was an accident. Make it three seconds again as well. And we're going to add a key. Now this one will be at time zero, but value one because it's starting at its current speed. And add another key. And this one will be at time three, three seconds long, at value of zero. I right click the drag, middle mouse wheel to zoom out. I'm going to right click this particular keyframe and click auto. And I'm going to drag it up because it's going to kind of be the opposite where it'll slow down gradually and then finally reach that speed. Compile, save. We don't want it to loop, it's just a one time animation. Go back to the event graph and send that this is ready to receive this stuff again. You'll notice that this is kind of the same thing over and over. And that's, that's fine. So we're adding relative rotation every frame. And claim from start, we got the fan speed for it to start at and stop. Oh, we got to check the alpha track because that's the amount of speed that it needs to give to the rotator. So it's starting at whatever fan speed we give it and it's slowly going down to zero. And the, this should be good. Now, one thing here. Remember how we have this animation continuously running, even though we apply this to it, it's going to continuously be running this. So we need to stop this animation at some point. 
So the way we can do that is we're going to put one step right before here. And this step is going to be to stop the animation. So we're going to drag off. We're going to type in sequence. And we're going to have it first. We're going to alt. Well, we're going to control left click to drag that. And we're going to have step zero, the first step, be to stop. Now to make this cleaner, we're going to kind of double click here on the line to kind of clean this up again. Double click again. There it just looks a little cleaner. So we know kind of what logically what's happening here. We'll drag this up. There we go. So first it will stop that infinitely running animation of the fan running. And then it will play the animation of it slowly slowing down from the from the speed that we give it in. And that should be good for the logic behind activating and deactivating the fan. Now, one more thing, when we flip the switch, we need it to kind of turn the the switch upside down, right? So there's a few ways you could do it. We're actually just going to use rotation. And we're going to rotate it on this green or this Y axis. And we will rotate it I guess 180 degrees. Yeah. Just flip it right upside down whenever we turn it on. So let's just save that. That means we're going to take this light switch, drag it down from the top left, and we're going to add relative rotation, just like we did with the fan. And depending on whether we're switching it on or off, we want it to change the rotation, right? So with that, we need a branch. Branch. And then we're gonna drag this into here. And so if we're wanting to turn it on, we want it to do one thing, which we'll have up here. We're gonna copy and paste this. If we want it to turn it off, we're gonna do this. Now here's the tricky part. We're not actually adding rotation. We wanna set the rotation. With a fan, we're constantly adding rotation because the fan only ever spins one way, right? whenever the fan blades spin, they don't spin the other way, unless you like invert it by clicking the little button on the top of the fan, whatever. But the fan blades only spin one way. However, the light switch will flip two different ways. So instead of adding rotation, we're actually going to set relative low ro rotation. Set relative rotation. So I'm gonna delete these two. And this will be the one we're gonna do. We're gonna set the relative rotation. Both the target is once again the light switch in both scenarios. And the rotation, whenever it's on, we want it to let's see. In the current state, its rotation oh well zero zero. Okay, in its current state, if its rotation is zero zero zero, it's set to off because the light switch is pointing down, right? So we want the off to stay. Alright, so that'll that's good. However, for the rotation, if it's turned on, I believe we said the Y axis should be just 180 degrees. And we can test that by going to the viewport, clicking on that little light switch and changing rotation of Y to 180 degrees. And yeah, it turns on or it flips up rather. So that was correct. So we're gonna go ahead and leave that there. We have that set here. That'll, that will now, based upon whether, on what direction we flip the switch on or off, it will, uh, adjust the rotation of this particular component, which is great. So we have activate, deactivate, flip switch all set up. And now we need to actually set up how um, the player will perform this action because it's not going to do it by itself. So the way we're going to do it is when the player walks up to the switch, he can perform an action. Now, let me put this on the wall. We Whenever we added the switch to the blueprint, some people might add, have those being two different actors, but really we want it to be in the same actor and we can just adjust its position in the editor scene. So if we, so if we click on the actor, you'll see both things are highlighted, but if you double click on the light switch, you'll have the switch, it chose, it selected the parent object and you'll see this under your, oh, under your details panel, how There we go. The details of this actor, you have what we had in the blueprint editor. You notice how the same, the same um, 
component structure. And so we're going to, the parent, you can also click it, so like click it there. We want this to be against the wall. So we can just drag it, reposition it. So I'm going to click E to rotate, rotate it 90 degrees and kind of drag it so that it's over here against the wall. Now it's not perfectly against the wall, it's fine, but if we turn off the grid, we can drag it and have it just be on the wall. Now for visual sake, I think our character is actually really small, right? Yeah, he's pretty small. I'm gonna put it here <laughs> and save that. So now if we click play, we're over here, we see the fan, we see the switch, but nothing happens. We haven't programmed anything. So click escape and let's go ahead and put that logic in. So we have all that ready and set up, but we need to have something to give us some kind of event that gives us the ability to click on the button. So what we need to do is we need to put, it's very common to use a collision box. So we're gonna click add component, type in box collision, it should show up. And box is fine. We don't have to rename that, it's perfectly fine. And we need to size this. It's up there at the core, but we want it to be here. So we're actually gonna drag this as a child of the switch panel, boom. And, oh. It was a child of the switch panel. It already was because that's how we created it. But make sure it is. And you can zero out the location by clicking reset to default and reset scale at default too. It's probably way too big. So we're, <laughs> we're going to rescale that by here. You can also press R and scale it here, which is fine. It's scaling perfectly though, which is kind of annoying. We're going to scale it over here. We want it to kind of be in front of the switch, more or less, so that when the player is standing in front of the switch, we're cool. And that should be good enough. Compile, save. We can test and see how big that box is. So whenever you're standing in that box, you click a button and do it. Now, this box needs to react only to players. So it's a collision box and collision boxes can do all sorts of stuff with physics, but we want it only to collide with players. So in the details, when you have the box selected, go down under collision and you'll see overlap dynamic, set that to overlap only pawn because pawns are what players are, they're player characters. So now it'll only have a trigger occur whenever a pawn overlaps it. And we need to add a component begin overlap function. So we have this component begin overlap and we need to have it to where whenever a player overlaps with that box, they're given the ability to have input on this, be able to click a button to interact with it, if you will. And so what we want it to do is enable input. So I right click type enable input and this is the um, action that we want to be performed. We want it to be able to have this actor have input enabled to a player controller that's playing the game. Now, the way we're gonna do this is we're going to cast this to the player pawn. And we're just gonna, since we're using the first person project, we're gonna cast to first person character. If you're using the third person project to be the third person character, it's whatever your pawn class is in the game. If you're unsure what that is, if you go to your world settings, this is accessed by going to Window, um, World Settings. And you'll open the World Settings tab. And you open up your game mode, you'll see the default pawn class is whatever you have set here. Maybe you have a different game and whatever your pawn class is, that's fine. So we're casting this actor, which is the actor that overlapped with the collision box that we have. And we're casting it to the first person character or the pawn. Now we need to get the controller, get controller, Who's controlling that pawn which is a player in the game and we're going to cast that because this actually won't accept um a controller object reference it needs a player controller reference because anyone could technically control it so we're going to cast this to the player controller some people in your game will have a player controller reference in their pawn and you could use that too but since the default template doesn't have that, this is how we're going about doing it. But now that we have access to the player controller, 
of the player who uh, interacted or collided with this collision box, we can now point the input to the right character, to the right controller. So now, once the player essentially runs into this box, they have control over the actor. They can press a button to interact with it. So we need to make a function for a button they can press. So we're gonna use the right mouse button. So if we type in right mouse button, you'll have an option here. So when this key is pressed, we want it to turn fan on or off to call this initial function that we had way up here, right? And at this point, we should be able to perform the action. Now, as of right now, this will work in single player, I believe. Um, let me make this big old screen. So we walk up, click the button. Ah, it doesn't work. Oh no, it didn't. Okay, I wasn't standing in it. And you see how it starts the animation up, it's spinning. I gave it the speed of, I think 30 or something. If you're noticing it's not spinning, you need to make sure that when you place the, the actor here under the details of the actor. Remember we had the setup thing that we created. The fan speed needs to be set to a variable. The default was zero and it, it won't spin. You'll see the light switch flip up. Nothing will happen though. But so I just set it to 30 or you can set the default over here under the blueprint, just set it to 30 or whatever. And it'll, it'll have a default value to spin. Um, but I mean, let's say we set it to 15 or something just to have this be a slow fan in general. And we click play. Let me come over to the fan. Oh, I'm not standing in the, I made the box too small. It spins a little slower. So, so it works. Oh, now that stopped immediately. That's not what we wanted, right? It just, boom, immediately stopped when I pressed the button. That is because I made a boo-boo and we needed it to, ah, I did finished. That's where it's supposed to be. <laughs> that was my error there. What's the tutorial without errors, right? So come over here, click the button. It starts, stop it. And it slowly slows down just as it should. Cool. So now we wanna see if this works in multiplayer. As of right now, you have a working fan in single player, but we don't have one in multiplayer. So first off, I'm gonna make this just a little bigger. It's too small and it keeps messing up. That's fine. Probably huge now, but whatever. It's you don't have to look at it as long as you're inside of this box, the way we set it up, you can turn it on. Um, if you wanted to make it to where you only turn on if you looked at the actual object, you'd have to do a line trace. Uh, we can cover that in a different tutorial. Well, this one is just merely for the option there. So we want to be able to do this in multiplayer. The way multiplayer works is that this particular action won't really work because it needs to, the server needs to be the, the one telling the fan to spin, not the player. And at this point, we have nothing telling the server to perform that action. Um, it's all just a custom event. We haven't told anything to make a call for the server or anything. And we're gonna use something called an interface to have the client be able to tell the server to perform this action here. So what we need to do first is we need to create that interface. So we're gonna come over here to our content browser. I'm just gonna bring open a content browser for yep, here. We're in the tutorial still. We're in blueprints. Well, I'll just make it out here. It doesn't really matter. Um, however you wanna organize it. We're going to create a blueprint interface. This is important whenever you're creating, uh, we'll probably put it in the blueprints folder, that's fine. But whenever you're creating things that, uh, actions that need to interact with other blueprints and you need them to be able to kind of make calls and interact with events and stuff like that. Super useful. I have only barely started tapping into interfaces, but they're really useful for multiplayer interaction and other things as well. We're just going to call this player interaction and we'll put it in blueprints. Why not? Now we have this inter player interface. We need to create a function here that can be called by one blueprint to another. And we're gonna, there's already one here, we're just gonna rename it. And we'll call this um, interact object, object, object. And we want it to tell or share the information of what actor it's interacting with. So we're gonna switch the Boolean to an actor, object type, actor, object reference. 
And we also want it to give it, uh, it's probably fine. Just, just the actor, whatever actor it's interacting with. And then the blueprint of the actor can define what stuff it needs to do. So now we have this interaction, th this interface created, and we need to apply it to the pawn because whenever you're doing multiplayer actions, a pawn is the only thing that can communicate to the server because a pawn is controlled by another uh, live player, another connection that somebody on their computer is connected to the server and they're playing with other clients on the server. So the pawn needs to be the one to make the call to the server to perform an action. So the way we do that is we need to actually modify our pawn class. Um, the default pawn class in the first person character is as I told you before in the world settings thing. And we can just click this little magnifying glass to browse to it. It's this little gun guy. So we can double click that. It'll bring it up here. And we're not actually going to mess with anything that they have. I'm going to drag this viewport up top. I'm going to squish this over there because we don't really need that. And this is all the default stuff. I'm just going to leave that there. You, you probably have your own stuff here, but we are going to create a new graph. This is just kind of for cleanliness. We're going to call this interact object. Yeah. Object. And it's just so that we have a clean slate to work with. I mean, we could work on the event graph and kind of go over here or whatever and just work over here, but just to kind of isolate everything that we're doing, we're going to put it in a new graph, a new space. And we want it to be able to perform an action whenever this interface function is called somewhere in the game. So to do that, the pawn needs to be able to listen for that particular uh, interface. Interfaces are added under class settings under pawns or in any blueprint, really. If you go to class settings, implemented interface, we don't have any really added apart from the default ones. But if we add the one we just created, which we did player interaction, it will now listen for any events that are called, any functions that are called from that uh, interface. So whenever another blueprint calls this function, it will tell our pawn to do something. So we need to do an event and it's going to be, what, what do we call that function? We call it interact object, interact object. You notice it has this little icon on here because it's saying that this is an event that was called from that interface. And we want it to call a function to interact with the server. Now the pawn is the only thing that can interact with the server. And since this particular call came from a controller, which was the player walking over and pressing a button, the, because remember the button, the, remember the player controller gained the ability to have input on this actor. And if we press the right mouse button, it's this particular blueprint pressing the button. This action needs to, that, that action is originating from the client. The action, the server call to make this fan spin on the server needs to originate from something that the server can identify with the player. And so what we need to do on the pawn is not only have this interface call, but also has a custom event that is run by the server. We're going to call this server underscore interact object. And we're going to have this replicate because this is multiplayer. We need to replicate and only run on the server. This is important. That way people just can't really nilly um, have the, the fan spin or have perform an action on the server. And we need it to receive the input of an actor, remember, because that's how we're going to know what action to perform. Object type actor, actor, there we go. I'll save. And we need it to, since we're specifically doing it with the um, BP ceiling fan, we're just going to cast it to this. Now you can always have some kind of filter set up if you wanted to do it uh, like some kind of master hierarchy of interactable objects and have it cast to an object and with a particular tag do a function or override certain functions every time an interact action is called. You can do that too. This tutorial is a straight example of how to perform it with just the ceiling fan though. And we want it to perform that turn off, turn fan on off. And this is the server executing, executes on server custom event. 
Now, so whenever this interface is called, we want it to call this function. So we're going to call this particular function and we want it to pass the actor that it is uh, referencing whenever that call is made. So we have the pawn interaction set up. And now we need to make the blueprint properly call that. Right now, it's just having it call the function itself, but you notice that that function way up here isn't run on the server. This is just run on the blueprint. We need to actually call the server. We need to know what pawn is making this action and needs to make that interface call in according with the pawn. So we're going to alt left click to disconnect that. We don't need that anymore. And instead, we want to get the player pawn so that we know who is making this action, who is pressing this button. And we need to have a call to that interface that we created. So we have interact object. You'll notice it has this little mail envelope thing because it's sending this request to wherever it's being held at. We're gonna put that over here with pressed. And the actor, well, that's that's itself. That's this thing, this, uh, this blueprint itself. So we get a reference to self. So now when the player inherits the ability to have input on this object, and they press the right mouse button. It's going to take the player pawn. It's going to make a interface call to this function. And it's going to pass the actor, which is the ceiling fan itself. And it's going to go to the pawn. It will make, okay, I have the actor. I'm going to run this function, which is executed on the server. And the pawn can make multiplayer executions on the server. And it will cast the ceiling fan, which is back to the blueprint and run this function as as a server as a server now in order for this to work properly we need some things to replicate because when this actor is moving in multiplayer we want all the players to be able to see the fan blades move we want all the players to be able to see this this switch go uh, the switch go up and down because that needs to be replicated that needs to be repeated over all the clients so those things need to be set to replicate it so if you click on the light switch just the light switch and scroll down to component replication, say component replicates. And we click on the fan blades and we go down to component replication, component replicates, and the actor itself as well. We need to make sure that if we click on the ceiling fan actor, the replication right here under replicates, it's check marked. We don't need to replicate movement because we're not applying physics to it and it's not bouncing around. It's the rotation is manually being set. So we don't need to check mark that mark. Just this one right here and compile save. Now that we have all that set and under the event graph, uh, see, we have everything set up properly. So if we control S, control shift S to save all, and we click here, this little button here, we're gonna switch this to client number of players to two, and we're going to click play. Gonna put up one player here in the middle shrink this a little bit and another player window down here the weird fov going on anyway so we have one player here i'm going to walk over where's the fan walk over here and i'm going to shift f1 use the other window so you see that we're two different players in the same game if i right click oh and the other thing we need to also replicate is this on off value because in multiplayer, everyone needs to know if it's on or off because right here that is being called. So we need to be able to replicate that as well. So if you click on that variable or click over here and click replication replicated, I noticed that I had an issue here. We need to have this fan turn off as default. That's what was messing me up. <laughs> Let's go back over here. Try it again. That was weird. So we have in view both things and we bring up this guy, walk over and we click the button. Boop. See how it turns on with both. And we now have a fan that's interactable and replicated in multiplayer. Now, if you wanted to have a sound play at the same time, you just you use these same functions that we have here and whenever you flip the switch to the rotation, you can have it play sound. You actually have to multicast that because sounds have to sounds aren't run by the server. 
um, you need to, sounds can be spawned by server, but sounds need to be multicasted to all clients so that all clients hear, hear the sound. So technically you'd have to make another function, custom event, play sound, make sure that this is multicasted and have it play sound at location and get past the location if you wanted to play sound you have the location come out here get world location I have that there I don't have a sound so I'm going to use the default gunfire sound that they have here and if you press play whenever the light switch is hit it plays the sound you might not be able to hear it because I have my sound turned off me there, it's super loud, but <laughs> essentially every time the light switches, in, it plays that sound. And both clients are the ones hearing it too. So, but yeah, that is how to set up a fan that works in player and single player. Because of the way we set it up, you actually, I mean, we can switch back to single player and it will still work because of how we did the interface calls. Because the pawn is the one calling the action. But it is that is the proper way to set up in the multiplayer as well, is have the action be performed by the pawn, not necessarily the other actor. So hope you liked it. If you have any questions, just comment me down below. But thanks.